I'm going to ask that you turn with me, please, to 2 Peter, the third chapter. And we are going to do a very abbreviated study of this entire chapter. 2 Peter 3 and 1. If you don't have your Bibles, you're going to be able to follow along with me here. This is the way it begins. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Now, please understand this. When you read a letter from the Word of God to a church or to an individual, these letters have been included in the canon with the understanding that they are divinely inspired and they speak to the church in every single age. And so it's just as if God, through his prophet and apostle, is writing a letter straight to us and only us in this generation. He is writing straight to our hearts. Peter was more than likely writing to the churches of Asia Minor. Some Bible historians feel that he was writing this letter just before his death at the hands of Nero. Now I want to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Peter's saying this, I'm not asking you to take my word for the warnings and instructions I'm about to give you. I want you to remember the words of the holy prophets concerning the end of the age and the second return of Christ. Do you know that there are 17 references in the Old Testament to the second return of Jesus? And this was long before the first coming of Christ? Do you understand that the prophets were intricately describing events of this day and age, even in Old Testament times? In Jude 1.14, Jude quotes Enoch. And this is what he says. Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Think about how long ago that was prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And then in Daniel 713, Daniel says this, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. In the Old Testament, the coming of Christ at the end of the age is mentioned over and over again. So the apostles said this to the people of his time and to those of us in this age, you need to remember what the prophet said about the second return of Jesus to the earth. Peter also encouraged the saints to remember what Jesus said about his coming. In the Lord's Olivet Discourse, which is the most one of the more famous messages that he gives in the New Testament, Jesus states this, Matthew 24 and 27. For as the lightning that comes from the east 
is visible even in the West, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four corners, the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Here's what I want you to understand. The coming of the Lord is near. This week, when I heard that there were armies fighting in Jerusalem, and I heard Netanyahu's chilling words, we declare war. And I understood that if you are a Bible prophecy buff, that you understand that in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it talks about coalitions of nations with their ancient names that are going to come against Israel in the very last days. Interestingly enough, for the first time in human history, that coalition is intact. And for the first time in human history, those nations are allies and are prepared to move against the West and especially to move against Israel. I don't know if you saw the comment of China about this conflict. I read it this morning. China was very quick to get involved. They said, we urge restraint and China, as their statement is a two-state solution, that there will be no resolution as far as they're concerned until there is an Israeli and a Palestinian state. Well, what in the world are they doing getting involved geopolitically with that tiny little nation on the Mediterranean? Because they are being brought by the great prophetic hand of God to that little nation where he is going to end it all by appearing in the brightness of his glory. You know, when I was a kid, we really believed the Lord was coming. You say, you mean we don't believe it now? Well, I think we believe it now, but I don't think that we believe it like most of us used to believe it. Because our lives were continually framed by our belief that Jesus could come any moment. And this is what you need to understand. God meant it that way. He meant it that way, that every generation would live lives framed by the expectancy of the imminent return of Christ. And we'll talk a little bit about the timing in just a moment. I remember when I was just a kid that I lived under such conviction that, you know, I, I didn't want to miss church because I was convinced that if I was going to drop out of church and go do something I wanted to do, that Jesus might come and I'd be left. <laughs> Never forget, we had a treasurer in our church that was the coolest guy. And he would sit on the front pew of our little church in Cedar Grove because that's where we began. And he would count the money. And of course, in those days, a lot of dollar bills and a lot of change. And so he would sit me right beside him when I was like seven or eight years old. And he would let me count the pennies. And it was just cool, man. I was helping the treasurer. Brother Gentry, he was like Santa Claus. I loved Brother Gentry. Now, his wife, she was a character. Let me just say this to you. Sister Gentry didn't come to church except on special occasions. And she was one good old gal. I mean, she had this huge sense of humor. 
And so um, I, I didn't miss church for ball games, but I will never forget my pitiful little league coach calling my dad and saying, we really need him to pitch. This is the toughest team in our uh, district. We just, we just need him. We need him to pitch tonight. It's pastor. Is there any way you can, he said, okay, he said, okay, I'll, I'll send him. I'll, I'll allow him to. And so he called the only person that he was sure wouldn't be in church on Wednesday night. And it was sister Gentry. <laughs> sister Gentry said, oh, I'll be glad to take Denny. I love ball games. And so sure enough, she picked me up, took me to church. And, uh, when we got back from church, uh, the house was dark. The church was dark. They had been out of church for a while and my mom and dad evidently had gone out to eat with somebody, but the house was dark. The church was dark. I was sure that I had missed the coming of the Lord. <laughs> I began to sob. I, I could not be consoled. I'm sitting there on the steps of our house, sobbing my eyes out in my baseball uniform. And finally, Sister Gentry said, what's right? She said, I, the rapture's taking place. And I'm left. She said, well, I'm still here. I said, yeah, you're left too. What I'm saying to you is that we believed with everything within us that the imminent return of Christ was a reality. Jesus is coming back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me say this to you. I can declare to you without any possible reputation or valid argument from any theologian or anyone in this world that we are closer to the return of Christ right now than anyone has been in all of human history because we are further along in human history than we have ever been. And what you need to understand is this. There are some poignant powerful, convicting words of Scripture that have been written to this end that we've got to be ready and we've got to be watching and we've got to believe with all that is in our hearts that our Lord is coming back. Every time there has been a great revival, truly a great, great spiritual awakening in any nation of the world, whether it be the Welsh revival at the turn of the century, or Azusa Street in 1909, or whether it be the Jesus Revolution in the 60s. Every great revival has come with the reviving of this message, Jesus is coming. Anytime the Holy Spirit has preeminence in an, individu in an individual's life, the Holy Spirit begins to minister the coming of the Lord to them. The Holy Spirit begins to say to them, Jesus is coming. The Son of God is coming. Help get the harvest in. Tell your children, tell your friends, Jesus is coming back again. And this morning, that's what Peter is pleading with us to recall. He is pleading with us to recall the fact that Jesus promised he was going to come. Now, let's continue. Verse three. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Scoffing, following their own evil desires. They will say, where is his, this coming, he promised. Where is it? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being 
and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. This is what Peter's saying here. Don't ask, where is this apocalypse? Where is this destruction? He says, God has already destroyed the world once with water. And he's going to destroy it again with fire. Listen to this, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And then, hear this, hear this. This is Peter speaking under the unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit, words that God wants you to hear. And he is defending his honor. And he's saying directly to those of you that have no longer believed in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus. This is what he's saying. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, folks, let me say this. That's one of the most powerful, gracious words in the New Testament, that last verse. This is what we just read. If you are saying, well, where is the promise of his coming? I mean, I've heard all this about the coming of the Lord all my life. Even if you're 71 years old like me, let me tell you, that is only a grain of sand beside the seashore compared to the amount of years that this planet has been rolling on and where God has promised emphatically that it is all going to end exactly as he said it's going to end. But he says, the reason I have not sent my son yet is because I'm waiting on you. Read it. He hasn't returned because he's waiting on you. Christ does not want you to go to hell. He wants you to be saved from the destruction that is coming upon this earth. So thank God we don't need to gloat over the fact that we think in our intellectualism that we can question the coming of the Lord. We need to fall on our face. We need to cry out to him. We need to repent. We need to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've heard that your coming was imminent, but thank you that you haven't blown the trumpet yet because you're waiting on me to get my heart right and you're waiting on me to reach my children and you're waiting on me to reach my loved ones. Lord God, thank you that in your mercy, you haven't come yet. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. This thing that is happening right now in Israel could be the final unraveling. This could be the escalation that triggers a worldwide conflagration and the end of all things. And I thought as I meditated that upon that the last couple of days, it was the same with his first coming, wasn't it? Except there were no news outlets and there were no warning devices in the hands of the citizens of the earth. But the Son of God came to the world 2,000 years ago and just silently slipped into history. And nobody knew. Nobody knew. He just came. And nobody knew. 
Only a few were aware of his arrival. And there are certainly more born again believers in the world today than ever before. But the majority of the world is oblivious to the fact that Christ is about to return to the earth. And as I was just going about my job yesterday morning, looking at some film of our next opponent and getting my coaching staff lined out and getting us ready for the week ahead, I thought, here I am. Just like so many across this city and nation and world, just going about my everyday business when actually we could be days, weeks, months, a few years from the second return of Christ. Amazing, isn't it? One of the most amazing things is that there is code language here for anybody who's looking that says everyone's going to see him come. Well, how can he appear in one part of the sky, say over Jerusalem and everybody see him? Well, this is the first time in history when everybody could see him. Everyone will see him return. And he will come with great glory. But verse 11 is the heart of the reason Peter's writing this chapter. And I, this is what we've got to get. This is the question he asks, and hear me. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, may I stop there for a moment and say everything you think is important today isn't. Some of you are sitting here and you are so offended because somebody took something from you. Don't be. Because... Everything is going to be destroyed. Even if you lived your life to leave a legacy, you won't. Do you know that your great-grandchildren's kids won't even know you? Do you understand that after you're in the grave that people aren't going to even gather regularly to talk about you? Do you understand that everything you're investing in right now will be destroyed? Do you know that in a few generations you can go back to your neighborhood and there will be strange people living in your house? Everything that you think is important today, if your emotions are attached to anything today, look at me and listen to me, friend. You are attached to something that won't be there. And even if it was ideal, it won't be there. It won't make you happy. I will never forget because Terry Bradshaw was like my guy when he was playing. Because Terry was, we had one quarterback between us at Louisiana Tech. Man, I love Terry. He was a member of this church for a while when he was with the Steelers. And I even had the opportunity to travel with him up to Pittsburgh. I used to help get him in shape before he went back to camp because I'd already retired from professional football. And so I love, man, I love me some Terry Bradshaw. But I will never forget when Terry Bradshaw won his fourth Super Bowl, he said that he walked out of the hotel the next morning and he was being picked up right there at the stadium. And he said, the wind was blowing the paper and the, the rubbish all across those parking lots. And he said all the fans were, of course, gone. And the excitement and the pomp and pageantry had ended. And he said the greatest emptiness filled him and a depression settled on him that he had to get treated clinically for. And they renamed this condition post Super Bowl trauma. Now that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Post Super Bowl, it's actually syndrome. And it's surnamed Terry Bradshaw syndrome. Because he was probably the first one to define it 
openly so that people could get their hands around it. Let me say this to you. Everybody in this world is headed for post Super Bowl syndrome. When you close your biggest deal, when you've got the house you want, when you drive the cars you want, when you've got the position you want, when you have had the greatest success in your life, the thing that is going to happen to you is that you're going to stand in the parking lot of your life after the pomp and pageantry is passed, and you're going to say, what in the world do I do now? And that's why there are beautiful young men with beautiful wives and children that decide that they're going to go chase another woman. Or are they going to go to the bar and suddenly develop an addiction problem that they were never meant to have? Because somehow you're trying to drown the sorrow of success. Everything, everything, everything is going to be destroyed. Everything is going to be destroyed. Let's see what he says. What, seeing that everything will be destroyed, seeing that the apocalypse one day will burn the whole world, seeing that there is nothing eternal around us, what kind of people should you be? That's the heart of the chapter. What kind of people ought you to be? And this says that it answers the question. Then he answers it. He says, you ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward, hallelujah, somebody say good news, to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. If you have come and given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have repented of your sins, if the blood of Jesus Christ has washed you clean, I got good news for you. There's not a chance on the planet that you are not going to experience a new heaven and a new earth. God is going to get you there. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, <laughs> how many are you looking forward to heaven, honestly? You're looking forward to it. Some of you may be like the old guy that sat on the front row and the pastor was preaching on heaven. And he said, how many of you are ready to go to heaven right now? And everybody raised their hand except him. He couldn't see the rest of the crowd that was behind him lifting their hand. He just sat there. And he said, well, he missed it. So he said, I want to ask one more time. How many of you are ready to go to heaven right now? And he still didn't lift his hand. Finally, he leaned over. He said, Mr. Brother Brown, what, why didn't you lift your hand? I, I, you don't want to go to heaven? Oh, yes, sir, I want to go to heaven. I just thought you said you was getting up a group to go right now. <laughs> but in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven, a new earth where righteousness dwells. So these are the instructions of this chapter, and they're found in just the last few verses. And we are going to, from this point on, make this sermon a prayer. We're going to pray together through the rest of the sermon. So then, dear friends, aren't you glad we've got apostles in the New Testament that call us friends? So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort. If you're right taking notes, I want you to put that down right now. Make every effort. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. This is what you have to understand, that if you are able to fulfill the mandate of the Lord, the command of the Lord, the expectation of the Lord in light of his coming, it will be because you made every effort. There is a teaching right now about grace that is so detrimental, and it's that Jesus does everything. No, Jesus does his part. 
by allowing us to be illuminated by what happened 2,000 years ago when he paid the price on the cross. But if you want to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him, it's going to take effort on your part. You say, well, like, what are you talking about? Well, maybe today you should go home and house clean. You say, what are you talking about? Maybe there's some magazines that don't belong in your house. You need to make every effort to clean up your house. Maybe there are some channels that don't belong on your television. Make every effort to clean up your house. Maybe there are some arguments that are ongoing with your spouse that you need to humble yourself and end forever. Make every effort to begin to be holy and blameless in his sight. You will never, ever achieve the things that God demands of you if you don't make an effort. Secondly, the word of God says this, verse 15, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. In other words, the things that you're going through right now are helping you grow toward God and you should never allow them to separate you from God. You should allow the trials of life to build patience in you because that patience that God is building is going to allow you to see your salvation much more clearly. And so you have to bear that in mind. Now, everyone pray with me, everyone. Dear Lord, please anoint me to make every effort to love you and to walk in honesty before you. I want to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with you. And Lord God, help me to bear in mind that everything I'm going through is creating something in me that couldn't be created if I never went through anything. So I thank you for this present trial and I give you glory. Verse 16, he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking of the, in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. He's talking about, he's talking about Paul's writings, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. You say, what in the world could that mean? Well, Paul was a great grace preacher. And what happens so many times is that you can take just something he says and you can totally broad brush your responsibility so that you think you have no responsibility to live right or to think right or to act right. But ladies and gentlemen, that's a lie. And if you create a doctrine like that, you've created a doctrine to your own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, how many of you have been forewarned today? How many know that I have warned you that Jesus is about to come? Amen. Be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawlessness. Now, this last phrase should shake all of us up. This is what it says. You can't be carried away by the error of lawlessness and fall from your secure position. Those of you that think that you can receive Jesus in a form, a ritual of prayer, and then go out and live like hell, scripture is for you. Don't you think that you can con Jesus? If you accept him and you apply blood that is holy blood that was shed 2,000 years ago, it is a serious matter. It would be better that you never made a commitment than for you to make some kind of bogus commitment and then think in deceiving yourself that you can go out and live however you want to live. Can't do it. You'll fall from your secure position, the word of God says. Now, let me just say this to you. Does that mean when I sin, I'm lost? No. I can tell you that my children make mistakes. I'm with them. I've got their back. And your God will have your back. But if you make it a practice, then it becomes a mockery of God. So you cannot 
mock God. It says, be on guard. Let's pray together. Father God, help us to be on guard. We don't want to be carried away by error. Keep me from listening to things that are going to skew my perspective of you and cause me to live foolishly. Help me to hear the truth, recognize it, and attach myself to it. In Jesus' name. But in verse 18, and we're done. The Bible says this, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Here's, here's something that I experienced in my own life, and I'm sure there are people here that are just like me. I have the habit of saying, that's just how I am. Anybody here have that? That's just me, baby. Hey, darling, you know what you married, right? You knew that when you married me. I'm not. Or we have locked ourselves into a pattern of being emotional about certain things. You know, I'm just tender like that. And I just, just offends me when you. You've been doing that since you were 17. And you're 67. <laughs> do, do you understand that change and growth are mandated in the Bible? Do you understand you shouldn't be you anymore? You should be a new version of you. Do you know that you who have been stumbling, offended, angry, got my temper, you should now be Agile, straightforward, powerful, unoffendable you. Do you understand that? Anybody here understand that? Because God wants you to become another version of you or he can't use you to do what you need to do. We had one of our very best players got kicked out of the ball game a couple of weeks ago. Well, he missed the last ball game. He was so angry that when I went to him and said, Gabe, what's, what's going on here? And I absolutely adore this guy. Let me tell you something. He's brilliant. He's the hardest worker on the team. He's a leader. He's sharp. He's everything I'd want my kid to be. And he's in high school. He's wonderful. But in this moment, he had, I mean, I'm saying his cheese had slipped right off his cracker. He was so, he was so angry, honestly. And, and he should have been because there was an official out there that let a guy hit him about eight times right in the face with his fist before he retaliated. When he did retaliate, it was unjust. He was thrown out of the game and missed his last game. But I will never forget standing beside him and I said, Gabe, you have got to overcome this. And he said in his anger, he said, I'm sorry, I can't. And I had his helmet in my hand and I threw it into his Shoulder pads right there. I just gave it to him and I said, I said, then you've reached your limitation. Here's what I want you to understand. You hear me? Is that when you get to a place where you lock yourself into an identity and you'd rather have your feelings than reality and truth spoken into your life? You have reached your limitation. God is sick and tired of a generation that goes by their feelings, by their whims, and by their fancies. He is looking for people that will stand and be the soldiers of the cross and declare, I know Jesus is coming, and I can tell you, I will not remain the version of myself that you see today, but I am going to be changed from glory to glory. I'm going forward in the power of God. I am going to do everything that my God declares that I can do in the world. I want you to stand and I want you to bow your heads and shut yourselves away with God. Let's pray.
pray together. Lord, your word says, grow in grace. Now, Lord, I, I right now pray that you will let me grow. And I want you to say this, everyone together. It may not be so about you, but it's so about a whole lot of people here. Listen to this. Pray this prayer. Lord, I know that I have not had measurable growth in a while. But right now, I pray you help me grow. I'm ready. And I'm ready to put myself in a position where I can grow in you. I'm going to ask three questions and then I want to pray because something powerful. Let me just say this to you. There's something powerful about movement, about moving with the truth. There's something powerful about physically moving. For instance, kneeling is certainly not required anywhere in the Bible. But there's something powerful that happens when you do kneel in prayer. When we ask people to come to the front of this, this church, we don't think that walking a few feet is actually going to make a difference in their lives. People have actually made that almost a cultish thing. I've heard people say, well, I went forward. It's not a matter that you went forward. It's what happened when you finally got there. Amen? But I want you to come forward. I've got three questions to ask you. Number one is this. If you'll say, Pastor Denny, I feel that if Jesus came to my house today, he wouldn't be as pleased with what he saw in my heart and in my house. And you'll say, I know. Listen, you'll say, I don't really think I want Jesus to come right now until I get some things straight. Until I call some people and tell them I'm sorry. Until I talk to my mom that I haven't talked to in seven years. Until I call my brother who I've been estranged from ever since we had an altercation at Thanksgiving. I don't really want the Lord to come right now until I can get some things right in my heart that I have honestly not wanted to get right. You say, but I want to get my house in order for the Lord to come. I want to be ready for him. And if I'm talking to you, then I want you just to come and stand because I feel like I really have an anointing to pray for you today. And I think that some things are going to radically change. But if that's you, then I want you to come forward and stand right here. And let's just see God do something. Just come right now. Come right now. I'm not, I'm not ready, really, for the Lord to come. But I, I want to be ready for the come of the Lord. Now, there are those of you here that have not received the Lord as Savior and Lord. Or you'll be like that player that I talked to you about. You, you want to do something, but you don't know what to do. I'm going to show you what to do if you come forward right now. You'll leave this place knowing that your name is written in the book of life. It'll be glorious. Come and stand right here at the front. Amen. 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 Here's the second question. Please listen to me. Here's the second question. You'll say, Pastor, where I am is that I have really let down on my life of devotion on putting myself in a position where God can speak to me. And you'll say, my life of devotion has been precious to me in the past. But honestly, I've kind of, I haven't tried to shove God away. I love him with all my heart. But I have not had that strong devotional life. You know what I think about every time I look at uh, Mark right here on this front row? Mark Pittman has an enviable devotional life. Every morning, four o'clock in the morning, Bible, coffee. It's amazing. But right now, if you're, you say, I've got to get that part back. I know that things are changing. I can feel it in the air like you can, Pastor. You say, I've got to get that back. I want you to come right now. Please come right now. Let's get our devotional life back in the Lord. Let's get it right. Just come and stand right here in the front. 
Here's the last thing. If you'll say, I have not exhibited in my own mind, at least measurable growth. And I am ready for God to begin to grow me again. Stand right, get right out of that aisle and come forward because I feel I have an anointing to pray for you today. Amen. I feel that I have an anointing to pray for you today. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Well, here's what I want to ask you. Do you feel full after having a whole chapter? I hope you feel full of the Word of God after feasting on a whole chapter of God's Word. Hallelujah. I want everyone right now, just respond to the Lord. How you, If you like to sit, stand with your head pow, do it. If you lift your hands, do that. It doesn't matter to me. Open, open yourself to God as I speak. I'm only going to pray for a moment, but I feel I have an anointing of God to empower me to pray for you. Everyone here, pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I give you my life totally and completely. Without reservation, I surrender all. I mark the spot where I am to say this is where I got ready for the return of Christ. And I thank you, Lord, for loving me enough to pull me close and to let me know when I'm missing the mark. In the name of Jesus, I will give effort to restoring my devotional life. My devotional life is not your gift to me. It is my gift to you. And Lord, I pray right now that I will grow and grow and grow and grow towards you. Let me never, ever stop growing in you. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and say, Lord God, I want new. I want all things to be new after today. And I give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord praise. So good. Hallelujah. I hope you wrote those four, four phrases down. Make every effort, bear in mind, be on guard, and grow. Uh, I hope to see all of you next week. But if between today's service and next Sunday, Jesus comes. I'll see you in heaven. Come on, folks. Let's give the Lord praise for that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.